saa tano um, i'm glad you for hapa uh, thank you for making the time to be here um, i know you for calling on me um, and i'm glad uh, you are here to attend my session so um, i'm going to be talking about uh, aws lambda and uh, resilient architectures um, my name is jacob baracha i'm a software developer um, I'm also the AWS uh, user group digit one. Um, I'm working on a certification for, for the cloud. So it's something I've been working for, working with for the last uh, almost two years. So today I'm here to share, to, to share a little bit about my experiences, um, uh, my knowledge uh, about building resilient applications. Um, Antonio was talking about Flutter. Um, she spoke about WordPress. She spoke about Node.js. So at the end of the day, after building all these applications, where do, where, where do they end up? They end up uh, being deployed on the, on the cloud. Um, and, and in most cases, uh, we often ignore. Um, uh, you just deploy it, working, and it's done. Um, I don't get it. Uh, but um, so today I'm going to take you through a few uh, things you should do maybe uh, to ensure that your applications um, uh, are secure, number one, uh, they're resilient. And, and my definition of a uh, resilient application, I think, is um, how fast do you recover when a disaster occurs? Um, how long does it take you to recover from that? That is my definition of uh, a resilient application. So we're gonna be going through event-driven architectures, and then we go through uh, place uh, security, um, uh, the key pillars of building uh, resilient applications, there are advantages, um, and many more uh, more things. So number one is event-driven architectures is a modern architecture where you build applications. Um, from small decoupled uh, services. So you're building applications, um, what I could describe them as microservices, each application running on its own. Uh, but at the end of the day, they connect together to perform the, the specified um, whatever functionality of business logic they are supposed to, to achieve. So unlike um, uh, the traditional models, uh, the monoliths, uh, where you're building the whole application, just um, a single application handling all the things. Um, we do lose coupling between the producer and, and the consumer. So the, the producer is an example of someone who, who is consuming whatever comes from that application. Uh, let's say an e-commerce shop, uh, you go online, make an order, um, buy something. You are an event uh, producer. And then there are consumers who now um, return or um, uh, update or uh, such stuff. Uh, so this is an example of uh, an application. So in between the event producer and the consumer, we have an event uh, router. It's an injection. Uh, it does injection filters and pushes the events to and from the, from the consumer. So for, uh, for instance, uh, someone goes on a retailer website, uh, you make an order, uh, it's sent to the injection um, for, to the event router for filtering, and then a request is sent to the warehouse database to check if a product exists. And then that request is routed back um, to you to update you that this product now exists, you can go ahead and make an order. So once you make an order, um, the next thing is payment. Uh, you pay, and then the next person who comes in is now the customer relations. So if you look at this whole, um, it's uh, uh, it's driven by events. Something has to occur for the next event to be to be triggered. So some of the benefits of EDA are um, they scale and fail independently. Uh, so you have an application, let's say um, a microservice messaging running on this on its own, uh, authentication running on its own. So 
when uh, part of the application fails, um, uh, it's only that piece of the application that fails. The whole system doesn't go down. Um, and then there is agility in terms of development for people who write code. Um, in the sense that we, um, so let's say in a team, uh, uh, this encourages um, the agile practices where um, everyone is working on something and then we just come in and piece it together to make up the whole system. Uh, it boosts morale, I could say, uh, in terms of how we develop systems and, 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 uh, and such. And then uh, building extensible systems. Um, extensible in the sense that you can build very huge applications um, user building them in pieces so um, it's uh, so if you look at building agile practices uh, you are breaking down the application to small pieces so if you break down to uh, you make it the more you make it smaller even if it's um, that huge that big scale uh, the more you make it very small, it's very easy to build and to scale that. And then it reduces complexity, that is easy. And then audit it is, um, in case of errors, bugs, and such stuff, it's very easy uh, to know where they occur from and trace them. And then we have um, cutting costs, um, building on serverless um, architectures. Um, in most cases, it's a pay-as-you-go model. Uh, you are paying for a service. Uh, you are paying for the function invocations that you make. You are paying for databases. You are not paying for idle resources. So it somehow parts uh, the costs you have to pay. Uh, for example, when you are building monolithic applications, you have to procure the whole system. Um, um, when you are ready maybe for deployment, you have to buy, let's say, a VPS, a database in this. Uh, give it a rough, a rough estimate of the amount of money that it will cost you. So with these um, um, services, for example, um, if you're using Lambda and um, Amplify, uh, they scale. They scale vertically and horizontally. Uh, this means that they scale with the databases and uh, the VPCs, the processors, uh, the memory you need, all these things as you um, as your traffic or um, let's say the people who are accessing whatever resources you have on your site increases um, the traffic spikes um, so and then number two we have uh, application design patterns uh, these are standard um, could say industry missions uh, they are defined um, they are meant for for problems or challenges that happen regularly uh, while building um, applications. Um, so there are a set of design principles uh, tailored for cloud services. There are software uh, design principles too. Uh, these are for cloud and some of them to apply still to, to the software world. So they should be sim speedy, simple, and singular. Uh, uh, Amber functions are uh, should be very speedy um, because um, the event driven um, there isn't that um, what could I say it? Um, like um, so you need to make an invocation for an event to occur so it just has to respond to that and that's it. Then we think of concurrent requests, not the total requests, in the sense that um, the moment you're making a request um, that's what runs. The next request um, you creates its own uh, so uh, normally for example cloud functions run on um, on um, uh, it's uh, I think it's volatile memory one that uh, it only exists uh, during the time you are sending a request or processing something and the moment it's done uh, that's it uh, next thing is share nothing uh, you, you create a function it runs once it's done, the only thing that remains is, for example, data that you need to store in a, in a database. Beyond that, nothing exists uh, in, your, in, your, in your service. And then you you assume there isn't a hardware affinity. Um, 
I've had this, uh, for example, in teaching business or someone asking you, you know, uh, you build, uh, for example, a mobile application. What about Mama Boga who uses a lot of papers? Uh, what about someone who needs a USB application? All those, I think, are kind of uh, resolved with the uh, with, uh, with design architecture for now. We are designing applications for the cloud. Uh, the moment you're done with that, um, the cloud will handle the other part of that. Uh, there isn't uh, things to do with designing the hardware in mind, or designing the user in mind. Um, and then use events to trigger transactions. Um, uh, when using, um, I'm gonna insist on, uh, when using uh, event-driven architectures, the applications are very fast uh, because um, your application runs only when uh, an invocation or uh, a function or an event is met. That's when your application responds to whatever you have. And then design for failure and, uh, and duplicates. Uh, uh, duplicates, not in the sense that you're designing, let's say, a function running 100 times and duplicating that in your database. No. You're designing uh, to ensure that. Um, Whatever your application does, it can replicate it or do it um, do it more than once or twice without affecting anything. Uh, it's like uh, testing whatever your application does. Yeah. Um, um, so these these uh, these application design patterns have uh, their own uh, their six pillars. So operational excellence, uh, your application. Um, um, should or uh, has to solve some business case or um, deliver something business ways. And then there is security builder, it should be secure uh, as much as possible, uh, reliable in terms of um, um, can I, um, for example, it's an e commerce platform, can I shop on this um, anytime I want? Um, how long does it take, for example, downtime and such stuff. Then there is uh, performance and efficiency. How fast does it respond to requests? Uh, cost comes in as one of um, uh, the big major arguments, especially with um, serverless architectures. Especially when, when you are comparing um, AWS, uh, there's Firebase with uh, Google Cloud, there's Azure and such. Um, how optimized are your applications uh, when it comes to cost? Are you just paying for resources uh, even when your application is in idle state? And then is it sustainable in the long run? Uh, is it, um, uh, are you just spending on it? Are you just running it and consuming resources? What do you get in return? Um, so these are some of the examples of use cases. For example, choose the right uh, run times to use. Uh, for example, AWS provides you with uh, popular uh, run times. Uh, we have an OTS for Lambda, Python, and Java, the net. Um, and then use layers for port sharing. Uh, this is to avoid duplication. Um, and then there is VPCs uh, for Lambda functions um, that need private access to your network. Uh, we provide that access to ensure that they are efficient as much as possible. Um, this is done with the IMI roles. Uh, IMI is a, like a template you use to specify roles for each application you create on, on that cloud. Uh, specify um, this application will access this resource to this extent. Uh, so it's a big uh, topic. Uh, maybe you can go through the AWS documentation to understand how IMI works. And then control traffic flow uh, between your uh, serverless components using step functions uh, for orchestration and uh, use the API gateways for APIs uh, and endpoints. So there is SNS simple query services and the SNS for, for synchronous uh, messaging services. This can also be used to uh, uh, to report, uh, especially when there are issues, for example, errors and uh, stuff. 
so they can be used to report back to you uh, if, if something happens um, and then you need to implement uh, failure handling logging um, and monitoring uh, uh, this to ensure that in case there is a failure, uh, you get to be updated very early. Uh, AWS provide you, provides you with a, a dashboard uh, specifically designed. Uh, you can go check out um, what functions have been failing, what my functions have been running, uh, uh, how much resources have they been consuming all this time they've been running. Uh, it makes it very easy for you to trace those errors uh, using logs. Um, logs actually have uh, the timestamps for every event or when it occurs. So it's very easy to trace it to wherever it occurs. And then uh, there is optimizing for cost and performance by setting appropriate uh, functional memory sizes, caching, patching, and uh, using target for intensive workloads. And then you need to automate um, deployment. Uh, there is the AWS service uh, application model. Um, there is the cloud formation, uh, which help you um, in automating this. There's also issues to do with environment variables, secret keys. I use AWS systems manager parameter to store them. And uh, this one provides you with um, an access key. Only your uh, Lambda functions have that access. So once they know um, an event, they can just send it to that event. The same way uh, when sending an API request, you send it with a token. So if you send that, you send it with a token so that that request can be handled with, uh, with the packet. Like an authorization mechanism. So it basically gives you a uh, system manager parameters to, to store these configurations and to ensure that they are safe. For, for many issues. Um, and then we have um, monitoring and case uh, your application has a problem or has, an, uh, has a dependency issue it can directly report uh, you can actually set them up to report to your emails visualization is provided by AWS it's a dashboard for, for error reporting and monitoring your applications you can observe every single event happening in your application and then there is tracing this is uh, now, the extra metrics and the logs, you can trace whatever this error occurred and then debug it. And then the errors are eventually things that one not, uh, not expected, abnormal behaviors within your, your applications. Um, so, in, in AWS or serverless architectures, uh, monitoring and observability are crucial uh, for understanding the health of your application. So these are some of the tools that AWS provides, AWS CloudWatch for monitoring. And then we have alarms, we have AWS X-ray, uh, does the same thing just like an expert, uh, checks through your application, um, provides extensive reports of whatever is happening. We have CloudWatch uh, logs, this from the 
end of this part, watch. Something happens, um, something happened somewhere. You can check over there that this cloud, uh, cloud, uh, cloud was logs and then find out what happened. Actually, with uh, last week was uh, AWS event, uh, they launched some very interesting things because right now you can uh, copy error message directly from uh, your console and then paste them into. Yeah, Amazon Q and um, check uh, through the database. They say that they trained Amazon Q on 16 years old data. That's a lot of information. Um, I've actually tried it. It's very interesting. It has a lot of information about the database. It can help you learn so much. Then there's logging, logging these. These are uh, like how events occur and analysis of that provided by AWS. And there's a synchronous implementation. Um, and then uh, we have error handling mechanisms. We have a retry mechanism. An error occurs. Uh, so to confirm that it's an error or uh, somewhere in your code, uh, it has a problem. So uh, the retry, with the retry mechanism, you are running the, the code again and again. Uh, Though this time you are running it without, um, um, let's say you're just running it isolated somewhere, um, not affecting the, the part of the application, just we're trying to understand what is happening. And the that, 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 that letter queues, um, uh, this uh, now after retrying and uh, eventually whatever you're trying is it working, it ends up in this DL queues. Uh, for later checking, then there's uh, throttling and timeouts. Uh, this happens. Uh, it's not working. Uh, it's uh, not in the DL field. So eventually, your functions time out and stop running to to ensure that you don't consume any any resources anymore. Um, lastly, we have uh, the security part of this. Of my presentation was very short. So just letting this up, take this home. Uh, we have the security part of this. And uh, this is very essential. Uh, I think as uh, most, of, most of the people here are developers, uh, most of the time we do know security. We just build and shift, that's it. Uh, you don't care. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometime back I was asking someone, do you think storing environment variables in the EN3 file is secure and they're like, yeah, it is the first one. You just write in code and play it and get done. Sometimes you end up with the environment variables on your GitHub. It's cold. Um, security is key. Uh, I think as much as we are reading applications, uh, you need to ensure that they are secure. So with AWS, there's IMI roles. Uh, this provides you the way. Uh, to make sure that each service you procure on um, AWS has a specified um, uh, level of access. It has, uh, you specify which resources it will access and cannot go beyond that. Then we have data protection, ensuring that uh, data in transit or uh, somewhere idle in storage is secure. Uh, we have uh, we are using Amazon Cloud Trail uh, to ensure the information you're putting out there is, uh, is safe. Um, oh, this is not working. This is so very interesting. Uh, so, lastly, I want to talk about something interesting as part of security. One of uh, one of the partners or the sponsors of this event has me. Uh, Sneak is a um, uh, kind of a tool. It provides you with a way out of the box to ensure that when developing your applications, they are secure as much as possible from the initial, um, from the past, uh, from the start, uh, starting developing from. It has a VS code extension. I've been trying it. It analyzes your dependencies, uh, tells you which vulnerabilities exist. 
uh, if we install it on existing repositories on GitHub, it's going to raise pull requests, letting you know that, uh, for example, these icons, uh, the version you are using is version 4 and the version 5. Uh, actually, it's something that affects most of us as developers. You have an application running on not version, I don't know, two, maybe version 19 or somewhere like that. Uh, these are things that expose our applications so much. So, please go try it. It's, uh, you'll find it interesting. And uh, I'm sure you'll come back with some, some feedback. Um, I thank you for, for listening and um, yeah, any questions? You must ask a question, even if it's my name. I don't know. Okay, um, thank you. Um, enjoy your lunch.